Good morning. So this morning I want to take a few minutes and talk about the LAMP stack. It's something which we probably all take for granted today. Um, but the term was originally coined in 1998 in a German computing magazine. It was really the first time that someone had gone and looked at how could they have a stack of open source components that all came together, in this case, looking to compete with Windows NT Server. And so really what this article put forward was this collection of an operating system, Linux, a web server, Apache, a database, MySQL, and a language, PHP, which you could use to build incredibly successful and scalable websites. It's become incredibly simple to go and get started with the LAMP stack, just a single line if you're on an operating system um, like Debian or Ubuntu to go and install these components. And it's something that's pervasive and easy to install across a number of different operating systems. But fundamentally, in the past decade or so, this acronym hasn't really been updated. It's still the LAMP stack, and people may change components here and there. But I think there are a few other pieces which have become incredibly important to build scalable and to build successful websites today, which is what I want to talk about this morning. So I think the first which everyone will agree with um, is a cache. Memcached sort of snuck in here as the LAMP st stack a few years ago. I don't think anyone will disagree with that. But there are a few other components as well. And obviously, we've seen the P at the end of it mean a variety of different things, from PHP as it was originally intended, to Perl, to Python, and a, and a number of other languages, such as Ruby. You've seen some components, such as Apache in the, in the past few years, be replaced with Nginx or with uh, Lighty. All sorts of different types of innovation are occurring around this general idea of using a set of open source components to build scalable and successful websites. So all of these are scripting languages. I want to talk a minute about some of the things that we've done around PHP um, it, from an open source perspective to really help it scale. We use PHP extensively. It's what the majority of Facebook's website is built in. Certainly everything of our front end is built in PHP. And it's a scripting language, which means that there's, there are definitely some engineering productivity benefits in terms of being able to create something, refresh it, see it in your browser, but some performance hits when you're going and running it in production. So we created a technology called Hip Hop for PHP, which goes and takes PHP source code, transforms it into C++, compiles it using G++, and produces an executable binary. Um, there's a talk later this morning by one of my colleagues, Hai Ping, who worked with about two other people creating hip hop over the past three years. We open sourced it earlier this year. We've seen on average about a 50% reduction in our CPU usage across our web tier by using hip hop. But since I only have 15 minutes, I want to talk about two themes which we've really been seeing as areas of innovation around the LAMP stack these past few years. The first is databases, and the second is really big data, or data analysis, understanding what people are doing on your site. So this is sort of our architecture diagram at a very high level. It looks like what you'd expect of most traditional websites, have load balancers, have web servers, services, backend services are cache, and then databases. There's been a lot of work the past few years looking at other forms of databases, the NoSQL movement, all sorts of different things. But really, if you take one thing away from the, the, my talking about databases, it's that there are many different options, and choose the one that solves the problem best in, in, for what you're needing to do. So the primary way that we store data, all of our user data that um, you are going and accessing when we're working on the site, with the exception of some services like Newsfeed, is actually stored in MySQL. So we run thousands of nodes um, of a MySQL cluster, but we largely don't care that MySQL is a relational database. We generally don't use it for joins. We're not going and running complex queries that are pulling multiple tables together inside of a database using views, anything like that. But the fundamental idea of a relational database from the 70s hasn't gone away. You still need those different components. So when we go and look at how our databases work, these are really the three different layers that we go and think about. We have the database, which is our primary data store. We use MySQL because it's extremely reliable. Generally, when we, something is screwed up, it's because a human did something wrong, not because the software failed. Memcache, and then our web servers. So we're going, getting data from the database, we're actually using our web server to combine the data, to do joins. And this is some of where hip hop becomes so important, because 
our web server code is fairly CPU intensive because we're going and doing all these different sorts of things with data. And then we use memcache as our distributed secondary index. And so these are all the different components that you would traditionally use a relational database for. What was gone and talked about 30, 40 years ago in terms of database technology, but they're just happening in different places. And so whether you're going and using MySQL or whether you're using a NoSQL database, you're not getting away from the fact that you need to go and combine data together, that you're needing to have a way to go and look it up quickly, um, or any of those things that you would traditionally use a database for. And then when you dig into the NoSQL technology stack, there are a number of different families of NoSQL databases which you can go and use. You have document stores, you have column family stores, you have graph databases, you have key value pair databases. And so the first question that you really have is, okay, what problem am I trying to solve? What family of NoSQL database do I want to go and use? And then even when you dig into one of these categories, if we just go and look at Cassandra and HBase, there are a number of differences inside of this one category of database. Cassandra and HBase make a number of different um, trade-offs from a consistency perspective, from a replication perspective. And so overall, you really go and think about what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? How can I pick the best database to do that and use it? Well, we store the majority of our user data inside of MySQL. We have about 150 terabytes of data inside of Cassandra, which we use for inbox search on the site, and over 36 petabytes of uncompressed data in Hadoop overall. So that leads me into big data. We run a Hadoop cluster with a little over 2,200 servers, about 23,000 uh, CPU cores inside of it. And we've seen the amount of data which we go and store and which we process growing rapidly. It's increased by about 70 times over the past two years. And by the end of the year, we expect to be storing over, the, uh, over 50 petabytes of uncompressed information, which is more than all of the works of mankind um, combined together. And I think this is really both the combination of the increase in terms of user activity on Facebook. Um, yesterday, we announced that over 500 million people use the site every single month. About half of them use it every single day. But also just in terms of how important data analysis has become to running large, successful websites. So I want to take a minute to talk about this from a product perspective. One of our teams was going and working on an email. We send a lot of email. I imagine many of you have received an email from Facebook already this morning. And they were trying to think about what is the most engaging email. They were looking at what could they go and send to users who hadn't been at the site, I think, for about a week. So I want you to take a look at these two emails. This is the first one that the team put together. It's a combination of some photos, of some t status updates, of text. And then this is the second email, which is just really simple, saying, hey, there are 92 photos. So I want everyone to vote on which email you think is, um, going, is the most successful. So how many people think the first email is the most successful? Success in terms of users receiving this email, going and, and clicking on it, coming back to Facebook. So first email. OK. And second email? So I, you guys are probably a little bit smarter than us then, because it's about half and half. Um, we certainly thought that the first email would perform better. It had more content. It was going and showing you more of the different types of things that had been happening. But we were able to go and use data analysis technologies, all open source, to find out that the second email actually performed three times better. And so if we had shipped what our gut was, what we thought would have been the better one, it actually wouldn't have been. And I think you see this in a number of different um, applications. We use data to make all sorts of different product decisions, from the emails that we send, to how we go and rank newsfeed, to even going and adding the like button throughout the site, and really understanding how these different features affect how people use the site. So this is the infrastructure which we use. Um, I'll take a minute to sort of walk through it. With all of our web servers, we use um, an open source technology we created called Scribe to go and take the data from tens of thousands of web servers and funnel them into HDFS and into our Hadoop warehouses. The problem that we originally ran into was too many web servers going and trying to send data to one place. And so Scribe really tries to break it out into a series of funnels, collecting this data over time. This data is pushed into our Platinum Hadoop cluster about every 5 to 15 minutes. 
And then we're also going and pulling in data from our MySQL clusters on about a daily basis. Our Platinum Hadoop cluster is really what is vital to the business. It is the cluster where if it goes down, it directly affects the business. Um, it's where we're going and, and it's highly maintained, it's highly monitored. Um, every query that's being run across it, a lot of thought has gone into it. We also then go and replicate this data to a second cluster, which we call the silver cluster, which is where people can go and run ad hoc queries. We have about 300 to 400 people which are going and running Hadoop and Hive jobs every single month, many of them outside of engineering. We've tried to make this sort of data analysis to help people throughout the company make better product decisions really accessible. And so that's one of the other technologies which we use, um, Apache Hive, which gives you an SQL interface on top of Hadoop to go and do data analysis. And all of these components are open source. They're things which you can go and use. And so really when we're going and thinking about how has this stack evolved over the past few years, we're seeing it obviously, um, you have a, a cache is something that's incredibly important. There are a number of different choices from a database perspective in terms of what are the, pro what's the, what are the problems you're trying to solve as to which is the best choice. We use a variety of different technologies for different pieces of our infrastructure and data analysis becoming increasingly important. And there being a really good set of tools now with Apache Hadoop and Apache Hive and Scribe to really understand what's happening on your site and make that possible. So I just want to end this morning um, talking a little bit about open source at Facebook in general. A large part of our infrastructure is open source. We really think that it's important in terms of being able to allow developers that are going and building with the Facebook platform to scale using a lot of the same pieces of infrastructure that we use, because it fundamentally, we're all running into the same sets of challenges um, together. And so, um, first of all, thank you all very much for the technologies that you've helped create that we've been able to use to make Facebook possible, and hopefully you'll go check out some of the technologies which we've released as well, which can help make your sites more successful. Thank you.